Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So inshallah we're going to get right into it. Verse number 52, Surah Yunus, Timeless Mercy, inshallah. Ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. Thumma qeem. And then it was said, lilladina, to those walamu who had oppressed or who had committed wrong, Duku taste adab the punishment al khuld adab al khuldi the eternal punishment. Hal shall you tujuzona be requited or recompensed? Illa except bima be according ma what kuntum you used to taksibun earn. Verse number fifty two. The wrongdoers will then be told, suffer now the abiding punishment. How else can you be rewarded except according to your deeds okay so if you're following the tafsir uh, this entire week now this is speaking about those um oppressors who in their lifetime in the lifetime of the rasul they had been asking for the hastening of the punishment for the punishment to descend if what you're saying is true O muhammad because remember they didn't believe him to be the messenger وسلم, then why don't you bring forth that punishment that you are threatening us with so it's uh, the ayah is saying that it's going to be said it's going to be said to the wrongdoers and it's about to happen that they're going to be told to taste the punishment that they were hastening on account of what they earned so if it was out of impatience that they were asking to see the punishment it won't change the fact that once it descends it's not just going to be something that's going to take care of their impatience and fulfill their demand it's not going to descend to satisfy their impatience or that insolent demand, which was, you know, let's see if there is an actual punishment or not. Let's see if we if we ask for it. Uh, will it actually come? Is he telling the truth? Let's see what it will be like, you know. The punishment is not something that's just going to be, you know, a, a fulfillment of that demand and come to fulfill their demand. Rather, once it descends, it is going to be something that lasts forever. It's going to be a punishment. Recording stopped. It's going to be a punishment that will, uh, you know, that will always be that that will never ever be Recording taken. Recording in progress. It is a punishment that will always uh, eternally afflict the uh, jahannamiyun, those that are destined to abide therein forever. So thumma qira al-ladina zalam udhuqu adab al-khul. So the ones that are asking for it's going to be said to them, okay, taste now the punishment of eternity everlasting torment and this is said to them on the day of judgment as a way of blame and rebuke like we have in another ayah chapter 52 verses 13 through 16 the day when they'll be pushed down by forced by force to the fire of hell with a horrible forceful pushing this is the fire used to the lie is this magic or do you not taste? Yeah, and remember they used to call the Rasul out of other things, they would call them also uh, call him also a magician. So, you know, they're going to be asked, is this um, magic or you're not able to see? So then burn and either be patient or don't be patient doesn't matter. It is all the same. Indeed, you are being requited or recompensed according to what you used to earn. And Sheikh Saadi Nistafseed mentions how once the punishment of the Akhirah descends, once it falls, the one that is uh, deserving of it, it's not going to be removed even for an hour. This is a punishment that has no breaks. When Allah says, عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ A painful punishment, we better believe that it is Anim, painful in a way that we cannot comprehend. We simply have to believe when Allah says, Anim, Ahlul Jahannam, the people of Jahannam will wish for death. They will wish for death in order for that punishment to be removed from them. And they're going to beg the keeper of Jahannam, Malik, who is the Khazin or the keeper of Jahannam, the angel who is in charge over Jahannam, his name is Malik. And actually, he's mentioned the Quran and Surah Al-Zukhruf 
um, verse 77, they're going to be calling out to him, وَنَادُوا يَا مَالِكَ لِيَقْضِي عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكَ They will cry, O oh, Malik, let your Lord finish us off. Ya Malik, Ya Malik. Tafsir Tabari mentions how Malik, the keeper, this, this angel who is the keeper in charge of hell, will not answer them when they will be calling upon him for a long time. They're going to keep calling and calling and calling before he answers them. Now, just think about this in our own homes, in our own lives. Think about how distressing it is when you call someone for something really urgent and they don't pick up the phone. They don't answer. And you call them over and over and over again. It feels like you're going to lose your mind. Or you call your child, right? And there's no response for them. Imagine you kept calling someone for an hour, two hours, and they would not answer your call. Or if you're in the home and you know your child is upstairs and they're awake and their door is open, imagine if you keep calling them for an hour, two hours, one day, two days, if you kept calling someone for that long that would not respond to you and you knew they were okay, um, other people would think you had gone mad, that you're continuing to call someone for such an extended time period without re receiving a response. This is actually indicative of madness, right? But what it really shows, it shows extreme desperation. This is the calling, the repeated calling of uh, someone even when they don't re receive a response for a long time, it is an indication of extreme desperation. It is the only thing the person who has no other way out, who has no other option, no other recourse, that is the behavior of such a, uh, a person in such a state of extreme desperation. Um, Tabari in his tafsir mentions how they will keep on calling Malik for a thousand years. A thousand years, and he will not answer them. And he will not answer them. And what I mean, this is something, subhanAllah, you know, we cannot, our minds cannot fathom the desperation of this. And when he finally answers them after a thousand years, what does he say? He will answer, You are here to stay. You are definitely here to stay you are not going anywhere there is no break from the adab there is no you know time out that you can take there is subhanallah this is your eternal reality now that response is so devastating it is so devastating that it cannot be described in human language that level of devastation cannot be evoked by any human tragedy in this world, no matter how horrible and colossal a tragedy is in the life of this world, it, it cannot evoke the kind of devastation that that response that they'll receive after a thousand years will hone in, bring home to them, you know, um, the reality of their eternity. It is an adab, this type of adab and torment is something that can only happen in the next life, we seek Allah's refuge from those acts that draw us closer to this Jahannam, where this is the ha, this is the condition of those who occupy. We seek refuge in Allah from that Jahannam. Allahumma jinna min al -nar. So you know, this is what we mean when we say no sin, no matter how pleasurable it is, how delightful it is, is worth risking Jahannam over. It is simply not worth it. No delight can outdo the torment of this reality we've just described. And this is what we can describe according to our understandings and our you know, limited human language. But what it will actually be is something that can only be experienced by the person in it. And then realize not only is the, uh, you know, the torment, one aspect of it, it is eternal. And some people may begin to think, oh, you know, this is so unfair. Um, such an intense punishment, such a uh, unrelenting punishment, you know, it seems so unfair. Well, the verse clarifies right here in verse 52. Illa bima kuntum Are you recompensed except according to what you did? So don't for a moment doubt that this recompense is based on full justice. There's not an iota of oppression or volume or tyranny, uh, you know, in the rendering of this 
punishment. It is based fully on just an account of what the people earned. You know, so really you sow what you reap. Like in this world, if we, you know, sow grains, we don't expect to reap grapes from that harvest. We're going to get some type of grain. We're not going to get grapes out of that, right? We don't have expectations in dunya for reaping something other than what we sow. But then why do we imagine that wishfully for the akhirah? Allah tells us over and over again, you're not going to get accept what you had sown in this life. You can't live a life of denial and godlessness and then expect Allah to bail you out on the day that is the day of being held responsible for how you lived and for what you sowed. You get exactly and only what you deserve in terms of punishment, but you get a lot more than what you deserve of reward for the people of Jannah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those. And the hadith in Muslim, the hadith al-Qudsi, which we related yesterday, about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O my servants, I have forbidden oppression for myself. So not for a moment think that Allah is oppressing his servants by giving them this eternal punishment. I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden amongst you, so do not oppress one another. O my servants, it is but your deeds that are record for you and then recompense you for. So let him who finds good praise Allah and let him, let him who finds other than that blame no one but himself. Okay, these are uh, the beginning and ends of that hadith of Qudsi that is in Sahih Muslim. Let's look at verse number 53. unaka, And they ask you, أَحَقٌ Is it true? Huwa? Is that? And we'll explain what that is referring to. Is that true? قُلْ Say, إِي وَرُبِّي By my Lord, إِنَّهُ Indeed it, لحق, Is indeed the truth. Wa And ma Not أَنْتُمْ You all be mu'ajizin will be able to render incapable and it will not be able to render Allah incapable 53 they ask you if what you say is true tell them yes by my lord this is all together true and you have no power to prevent the punishment from befalling so the fact that they're asking ahaqqun hu that you know is uh, they're still plagued by doubt they could not come to terms with the reality the messenger was imparting to them about what? What is? What were they asking? Is it really true? They were asking about the return and the resurrection from the graves after the bodies had become sad. This was very hard for some of the mushriki to grapple and take in. That after we become dust and bones, after we have become one with the earth, then how? As, and it's very humbling to think, subhanAllah, it's very, very humbling to think that we are about to become one with the earth. Very humbling to think that this body that we nurture and take care of and moisturize and, uh, you know, strive to beautify and, um, you know, give attention to is, is about to turn into dust. It's about to rot. It's about to deteriorate. It's about to turn into bones. It's going to become one with the uh, earth so that if, you know, someone were to come and you know, uh, dig up a grave, they would not be able to find the person, right? Disintegration, deterioration. But subhanAllah, Allah is Qadir. Allah is Qadir over resurrection of that individual from the graves after the bodies go through this inevitable human fate. So what they're asking is, Asahihun hasul ibad, as Sheikh Saadi mentions, is the hashal, is the gathering of the servants of the people really true that they will be you know resurrected back after their death for this day of appointment and you know a time of recompense for the servants according to their actions good for good evil for evil this was their question is this really true still plagued by doubt so the rasul is told to tell them Qul Yes, by my Lord, it is the very truth. And you are not going to uh, make Allah incapable of bringing you back. You cannot make Allah incapable of bringing you back just because you disintegrate and become invisible to uh, human beings around you. 
but this does not render Allah incapable of bringing you back. Because remember, He originated you from nothing. He brought you forth when there was nothing of you, right? So now that you know there are some remnants of you mixed with the ground, with the soil, uh, He can He can bring you back, right? Okay, let's look at verse fifty-four. Walo and if. Anna that li kulli for each nafs soul volama that had oppressed ma that which fi in al abd the earth laftadat would surely have ransomed bihi with it yani with all that is in the earth wa asabu and they concealed they hid anadama the regret and they concealed the regret. لما when رأوا they saw العذاب the punishment وقضية and was judged بينهم between them بالقسط with justice وهم and they لا were not or shall not لا يظلم shall not be oppressed or wrong in the least verse fifty four if a wrongdoer had all that is in the earth he would surely offer it to ransom himself. When the wrongdoers perceive the punishment, when they see the chastisement, they will feel intense remorse in their hearts. But a judgment shall be made with full justice about them. They shall not be wronged. So this has, this is something we had alluded to yesterday, about the person who wrongs their own self. At that moment when they see the punishment, that person will be ready to give up the whole world to get out of it, to ransom himself, herself with the whole world and to save themselves from that punishment that will then be before their eyes. But that would not avail them at all. No benefit or harm can, you know, uh, we cannot work deeds of benefit or harm in the hereafter because the jaza. The recompense is the only thing that occurs in the akhirah. The time to benefit ourselves is in dunya, which is darul amal, the abode of action. Over there are only the consequences of those actions, either benefit or harm, according to the deeds. The reward and the punishment will rest fully on the good or the evil nature of our actions. SubhanAllah, if you think about this verse, the whole world being willing to give up the whole world, everything in it. The world because of which we neglect our Lord and His remembrance, this world that appears so beautiful and delightful to us, this place where we invest our youth, our time, our energies, we pursue lucrative careers to maximize the pleasure of this temporary stay. This same world will be the same one that a person will want to totally give up in its totality to escape the punishment. It loses all meaning, subhanAllah. The world shall lose all meaning. This is what we had mentioned yesterday um, in the trailer of Sheikh Omar Suleiman's series for this Ramadan. It's a very powerful statement. One of my favorite from that clip is that while in this world, even an atom's weight of good will be accepted from the doer if it is sincere. But on the day of judgment, even the whole earth in gold would do you no good. SubhanAllah. We see that right here in this verse, right? And Allah does not ask us to give up the whole world. He only asks us to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and then remain true to that tes testimony, right? He doesn't ask us to give up the whole world. He says, you know, we have our share in this world. رَبَّنَا آتِينَ فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا Allah give us good in this world and in the next world. This is a Qur'an a dua we are taught. So we are not asked to give up, give up the world. We can enjoy it and seek the next through it and through its blessings while remembering our Lord. But one who does not understand that this is the way we are expected to live then that person is the one who want to give up everything, but it shall do him or her no good. So the acts of disobedience that are so tempting and pleasurable in this world become sources of 
regret and shame in the next world. The falling of desires, which is so alluring and enjoyable to us, turned into sources of destruction and distance from our Lord. Not worth it. We know from Surah Shams, successful indeed is the one who purifies his soul and doomed is the one who corrupts it. And nothing corrupts your soul the way following your desires does. It is total, full, automatic, you know, total corruption occurs for the soul by following one's desires. The emotion that this verse mentions that I want to focus on for a few minutes, that the people will feel when they see the punishment, is the horrible emotion of regret. And they will try to conceal the nadama, the regret. Nadama, regret that they will feel when they see the punishment. They will regret intensely and will try to hide it. And of course, they'll be judged with full justice. Not only mentions in his tafsir, when the wrongdoers perceive the chastisement, they will feel intense remorse in their hearts. When all of a sudden they face the torment on the day, which they had denied throughout their lives, and on that presumption had gone on doing wrong deeds. Not only this, they will also feel very sorry very regretful that they had denied the messengers and brought baseless charges against them who had warned them of it. Therefore, when they witness it against all their expectations, they will find the ground slipping from under their feet and will feel utterly helpless and guilty in their minds because of the remembrance of their wrongdoings and of the pricking of their conscience. In short, their condition will be that of a gambler who turns a deaf ear to the counsel of his well-wishers and stakes his all on mere speculation and then goes bankrupt. But such a person has only himself to blame for his pathetic, despicable, sad plight. Now regret, subhanAllah, regret, I hope none of us have to experience this, it is one of the worst emotions. It is that emotion that has the potential to paralyze, to throw a person into a dark abyss of self-pity, grief, and debilitating inaction. It can just you know, paralyze you into not doing anything. It can be so heart-wrenching. And if you look at look it up online, you know, the way regret is described as a negative emotion that occurs when a person believes his or her past actions or behaviors, if changed, may have achieved a better outcome. Regret is often closely associated with feelings of guilt and shame. Look at this description. It's a very good description, right? Listen to it again. Regret is a negative emotion that occurs when a person believes his or her past actions or behaviors, if changed, yani had they been different, may have achieved a better outcome in the now that they are in. So, you know, it's like the idea when we talked about the cult of super productivity. It, we said the whole art of productivity requires you to win against yourself, to behave and be productive and act in a way that your future self won't hate your present self, right? And if you look at the uh, I was looking at an abstract of an official academic uh, paper in psychology. It was titled, What We Regret Most and Why. And the thing, one of the things it mentions in its abstract is greater perceived opportunity within life domains evokes more intense regret. Greater perceived opportunity. Yani I had this this you know this great opportunity this great chance to really have elevated myself and gotten far in my career my field my relationships etc but i didn't so it's when you have the chance greater perceived opportunity knowing you had the chance in this or that field and not having taken advantage of it even though you had the chance that evokes the most intense type 
of regret later on. And the paper also says, perceived free choice of actions and decisions is necessary for later regret, something they call cognitive dissonance to emerge. Perceived free choice of actions and decisions is necessary for later regret to emerge. And, you know, I was looking at this paper and I was like, subhanAllah, this is so accurate, you know. It's when you see you had the chance to do something that would have elevated you later on, but you didn't do what you were supposed to do at that time. And what you're left with today is regret. And subhanAllah, note how in the life of this world, that's exactly what we have. We have free choice of actions, what we call free will. This is the operating principle of accountability, right? If there was no free will, then hisab, accountability, the day of judgment would make no sense, right? If, if a person had the choice to believe or not, um, because we do have the choice to believe or not to believe, that is why hisab makes sense, right? And this is why those who lose out on that day are the real losers, the eternal true losers, khasirun, because um, they had this full opportunity to make it big, to make it to paradise, but they did not avail of that opportunity. This is why life is so precious. This is why every moment is so precious, subhanAllah. To remember our Lord at all times is so precious because it elevates us in the next world, right? And, you know, like that beautiful saying, I don't know what the moments between the seconds are called, but I remember you in them. This life of God consciousness, so that, subhanAllah, that day we can minimize regret. Now, everyone will have regret. Uh, this is the unfortunate but inevitable reality of humanity on that day because Every one of us at the end of the day could have done more, could have started practicing earlier, could have been more conscious of Allah, could have done, you know, more than we will wind up doing at the end of the day, right? Which is why we need Allah to forgive us. But going back to the concept of free will, which is why there is this intense regret later on, you see in Surah Al-Kahf, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And say, O Prophet, this is the truth from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَأْ For so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, then let him disbelieve. Complete free choice, subhanAllah. Complete free choice. But just like in dunya, we regret our actions when we see the consequences of our choices. Akhirah, if you think about it, is the ultimate abode of consequence, Right? That is the, the, the face, the picture, the result of our deeds. It is the ultimate abode of consequence. The hereafter is the, the eternal consequence of this temporal, temporary abode where we are asked to make a voluntary choice, to believe or not to believe. But making the wrong one has a terrible aftermath. Yes, you're free to believe. There is no compulsion in religion, but you better make sure you make the right choice using the faculties of, you know, mind and senses and eyes and ears and hearts. Because if you don't, Al-Kahf 29, Surely we have prepared for the wrongdoers a fire whose walls will completely surround them. You know, sometimes I think of the claustrophobia I have, the claustrophobia many people have. Jannah is not just horrible because of the punishment and because it is, you know, so horrible, we cannot describe it, but it is also a claustrophobic experience of punishment. Ahata bihim, suradik ahata, encircling, enclosing, a fire whose walls will completely enclose, surround them. When they cry for help, they will be helped with water like molten metal. Yeshwil wuju, which shall burn the faces. Bi'sa sharabu sa'at murtafaqa, what a horrible drink and what a terrible place to rest. 
but they will still drink it because the thirst will be so intense. You know, you can only imagine the intensity of the thirst if someone would actually drink this kind of a drink. You can imagine, or cannot imagine rather, we cannot imagine the intensity of the thirst that will force the people to drink this type of a drink. So, you know, this is not to be gloom and doom, you know, doom and gloom today, but it is to really act on Basira. It is to really know what we need to know to be able to act in a way that we can protect ourselves from this fire. رَبَّنَا أَتِينَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا Allah grant us the good of this world. وَفِي الْأَخْرَةِ حَسَنًا And then good of the next world. وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And save us from the fire. And this is why there's these details of the fire. Some of them given in the Quran to warn us that, you know, better behave yourself in this ajal, this temporary 20, 40, 80 years of life that you have. And note that the punishment of the hereafter is not just a physical punishment which of course it is you know the burning of the faces the um how the punishment will cause the intestines to melt and you know horrible physical punishment but it is also a spiritual and or, or emotional punishment and this emotional turmoil varies in degrees the level of grief varies in degrees everyone even believers will have their regrets right for example, there is a narration. Just want to mention a couple things that will cause regret in the hereafter that we learn from hadith. So one is um, a Hassan narration, uh, the collection of Muhammad Taala. If a people sit in an assembly in which they do not remember Allah or invoke blessings on the Prophet, وسلم, it will be a cause of grief to them on the day of resurrection. Something as benign, we may think of as benign as that. We did not backbite or sin or lie or, you know, plan things against other Muslims or speak ill of anyone. But just the fact that you, we did not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a certain gathering, or we did not send salawat on the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a certain gathering, it's going to be a cause of grief to those people of that gathering on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Why? Because it was a lost opportunity. Every subhanAllah Every time we say subhanallah is an elevation in the akhirah. It is an increasing of ranks in the akhirah. So how many missed opportunities, subhanallah? How many missed opportunities have all of us, uh, you know, uh, missed out and have gone through, right? And then there, are, so the lesson from this is to avoid negligence at all costs. Be as mindful as possible. Be as remembrance filled as possible. You know, like that beautiful quote that I love so much. I don't know what the moments between seconds are called, but I remember you in them. The beautiful, all in devotion, the soaking, the deeds and life soaked in love perspective. This is perhaps the best bet, the best chance we have to minimize our regret, inshallah. So lessons, avoid negligence at all costs, as much as you can. And number two, this is another thing that will increase or cause regret in the hereafter. And this is obviously, you know, extremely intense, what I'm about to share. Is that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us about none will enter paradise, but will be shown the place he would have occupied in the hellfire had he rejected faith, so that he may, may become more thankful. And none will enter the hellfire, but will be shown the place he would have occupied in paradise if he had had faith so that may be a cause of sorrow for him. So every Jahannami, every pe- person of Jahannam of the hellfire will be shown the place they could have had in Jannah if they had had Iman. And this will be, a, can you imagine the intensity of the sorrow, the ultimate regret? which will exponentially intensify the experience of punishment of this person. We seek Allah's refuge from that. So remember, Jahannam is not just a physical torment, which it is. It is also an emotional, spiritual, mental torture as well. Allah We seek Allah's refuge from this. Let's look at verse number 55.
ala indeed inna again indeed lillahi for allah ma that fi in as samawat the heavens well out and the earth ala indeed or most certainly ala inna indeed these all uh, at or there's all particles of emphasis wa'ad allah the wa'ad the promise of allah haqq is true ولكن and but أكثرهم most of them لا دون يعلمون do not know verse fifty five indeed all that is in the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah and most certainly Allah's promise will be fulfilled though most people are not aware of it to Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth He manages manages it as He wills determines predetermines as He wills and will judge with full justice. His creation when He wills. Most people are not aware of this fact that for Allah is everything that is in the heavens and the earth. That His promise is true, right? The ayah tells us that most people don't know. Most people don't know that this promise of Allah's promise is absolutely true. Ibn Kathir mentions Allah is the owner of the heavens and the earth. His promise is true and is indeed. Going to be fulfilled. He is the one who gives life and causes death. To him is the return of everyone, and he is the one who has the power over that, and the one who knows everything about every creature, its deterioration, and where every speck of it has gone, be it land, oceans, or otherwise. Allah knows where every speck of our deteriorated bodies and bones goes into and mixes with. He is Qadir, all capable over all things. He is all capable over this thing that they doubted, this regeneration of all our body parts, with every atom's worth of DNA, even if its dust were to be scattered and spread all over the earth. And this reminded me of the hadith of that sinner who feared Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The hadith is in Muslim and Bukhari. And it says a man sinned greatly against himself, and when death came to him, he made his sons in charge of something. Right? He charged his sons, saying, "When I have died, burn me, then crush me, and scatter my ashes into the sea. For by Allah, if my Lord takes possession of me, He will punish me in a manner in which He has punished no one else." So they did that to him. Then he said, "Yani Allah said to the earth, 'Produce what you have taken, Subhanallah. Produce what you have taken.' And there he was. That man came together, all assembled back, you know, from what he was. And Allah said to him, He said to him, Allah asked this man, 'What made you do what you did?' He said, 'Being afraid of you, O my Lord, being frightened of you, and because of that.'" He forgave him because of that Allah forgave him. Subhanallah. So this shows how Allah is Al Qadir, how He is all powerful and capable beyond our limits of logic. We think that if we were to scatter ourselves all over the uh, you know world, literally in the land and the oceans, that you know this, how is it possible then to bring us back and only our DNA, right, our specks, our parts, not mixed with anyone else? But Allah, all He has to say is, "Kun," because He is the owner of the heavens and the earth. Because he, everything is really under His complete and total command, right? Realize the power, and then of course the other thing is the forgiveness, because this person was, you know, true in his fear of God. That was, Subhanallah, what made Allah forgive, you know, Allah forgive him on account of that. So this is the power of the one to whom belongs the heavens and the earth. We are not the owners of the land; we are the slaves, the servants of God, and must never forget our position and responsibility to Allah while we are on this earth, right? And Subhanallah, this is so valuable: recognizing and fulfilling one's position, fulfilling one's recognizing one's role, and then fulfilling it. You know, discharging the responsibility Allah has placed on us. This is where success lies. This is where nobility lies. You know, when Shaytan overstepped his bounds, 
and desired something that was not his due. When Shaitan, uh, you know, Iblis was, uh, you know, so uh, worshipful before he became Iblis, before he became Shaitan. What happened to him? You know, do we ever think about that? He, he forgot what his position was. He overstepped his bounds. He left his role, which he had, he stayed there. He would have, he was with the angels. He was as worshipful as the angels, you know, for a jinn to be as worshipful, to be in the ranks of the angels is a big deal, right? But how did he lose all of that? It's when he forgot his role in the creation. He forgot his position as a worshipful servant that that's where his nobility and honor lay. So when he forgot that and desired what was not his due, overstepped his bounds, he fell from the ranks of the angels and became forever cursed and removed from divine mercy. On the other hand, the example of Adam alayhi salam, he recalled his position of servitude after he made the mistake of eating from the tree, the forbidden tree. He recalled his position once again, his position of servitude. And because of that, he turned penitently to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his dignity was fully restored. His tawbah and that of Hawa alayhi salam was, was fully accepted. And Adam alayhi salam, not only was his dignity uh, fully restored and his tawbah accepted, but his honor was further amplified and he was elevated to the rank of a prophet. So realize that our nobility, our honor, our dignity lies in realizing, recognizing, and then clinging on to the position role Allah has given us, which is ibadullah, the servants, the slaves of Allah. And this was the most beloved, most honorific title given to our Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah, right? The slave of Allah. So if we can remember and stay in our place, then we can leave it to Allah to give us our place in paradise, inshaAllah. And here the verse mentioned, in that indeed the promise of Allah is true. The promise of Allah is true in a way that it is more true than the greatest truths and facts that we swear by. It is greater than the scientific truths that have been proven and published in textbooks and taught as global facts. More true than all of these scientific truths, which we believe to be true and with good cause. But what Allah says, what he reveals, those truths are even more true, right? SubhanAllah. I mean, think about it. What is more true? The scientific facts that human beings have discovered after and because of using their intellects properly. And by the way, that shows the power of the intellect and how there's no excuse to say that I don't understand uh, what Allah means. I don't understand Islam. I don't understand the Quran. Um, because we do understand these fancy scientific theories. And, you know, if we pay attention in science class, you know, a lot of them do make sense and appeal. Um, you know, some of them don't, but many of them do. So the scientific facts that human beings have discovered by proper use of their intellect, are these more true or the truth the creator of the intellect has unveiled himself in his book through his kalam, through his speech, through his spoken word? So just as all of Allah's verses are true, his promise of resurrection is also true even though most people don't know it. Most people, you know, are not on the true path. They are not on Islam. While they may have great respect and appreciation for the sciences, these same people become clueless about the akhra, clueless about the purpose of their existence, about where they are going and for what they were created. Don't blame the intellect, right? That I don't understand. Um, because that same intellect is capable of understanding many complicated scientific theories. And after properly using our intellect, we're able to arrive at those as, as the human race, right? But then how can we make the claim that that same intellect can't introduce me to my Lord, whose existence is something my fitra testifies to? Okay, let's look at 56. Huwa he... Yuhi brings life, wa, and yumit causes death or gives death. 
wa and ilayhi to him turja'un you shall return or be returned or are returning 56 he it is who gives life and causes death and to him shall you all be returned 56 he is the beautiful all powerful all capable grantor of life and death and to him is the return you know you cannot escape your roots you cannot change who you are and where you came from and at the end of the day all of us go back home regardless of where we spend the day regardless which countries we visit and tour at the end of the day we all come back home and we can't change who we are and you know where we belong similarly no matter how long we stay in this world our being began with a word from him kun and it shall be terminated by him so regardless of how long we stay here we're going to, going to have to go back to where we came from we're going to be resurrected once again by his command and we will then be ushered into his presence on that day that no one will be absent will be ushered into his presence on the day when no one will be absent. And to him we shall be returned. That is the return to our true home, the abode that the hearts of the believers long for. The abode that the hearts of the disbelievers don't believe in. But it does not change the common shared destiny of, destiny of humanity, which is that we are all walking back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether we know this or not, whether we accept this or not, whether we live lives according to this reality or not, that the path is the same. And that is the path of return to our Lord. And everyone in Jannah will know their home better than they know their homes in this world. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ghuruf of Jannah. The ghuruf are those special residences of Jannah. You know, Jannah is not just one type of accommodation. You know, Just like here, the more money you have, you can uh, afford a three-star or five-star hotel, um, you know, or maybe a suite or, or maybe a loft or maybe a penthouse, right? Depending on... Um, so these are kind of like the penthouses of Jannah, right? The Rasulullah said in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, which means the dwellers of Jannah We'll see the upper abodes of Jannah as you see stars in the sky. SubhanAllah. The ghuruf. Nabi mentions the ghuruf. So ghuruf are like the penthouses, like the upper abodes of Jannah. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa Allah always gives us a tawfiq to, you know, do um, actions of the ghuruf, right? Not just Jannah, but al-Firdaus al-Ala. And the ghuruf in al-Firdaus al-Ala. And the ghuruf in al-Firdaus al-Ala next to our Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without any hisab or adab, right? Without any accountability or punishment. So, you know, aim for the highest thing, strive for the highest thing. And then it is ultimately by Allah's tawfiq that we get any of that. It is not because of our actions ever. Because Jannah can never be bought by our actions alone, right? Our actions, as we've said many times, are a cause. Allah has made them a sabab or a cause of entry into paradise. Those who believe and do good deeds, but they can never amount to the cost of paradise, which is uh, really, really priceless. It's something Allah will shower upon us out of His mercy, inshallah. Okay, and we'll begin the last verse and let's um, try and inshallah finish it for today, verse number 57. Ya ayyuhannas, O humanity, O people, qad. Indeed, ja'atkum has come to you mawa'idha. What has come to you? A mawa'idha, an exhortation. Min from rabbikum, from your Lord, wa shifa, and a cure, lima, for that fee which is in as-sudur, the chests, yani the hearts. Wa huda, and a guidance. Wa rahma, and a mercy lil mu'minin for the believers. Verse number 57. O oh, mankind, now there has come to you an exhortation from your Lord, a healing for the ailments of the hearts, and a guidance and mercy for those who believe. Beautiful, beautiful verse. How fitting uh, that, to be studying uh, this verse in Ramadan, 
It has many, many features. It talks about what has come to us. An exhortation has come to us. Mawa'ayla, an exhortation, which Sheikh Sadi says, exhorts you against those actions which bring upon the wrath of God and his punishment and warns you by explaining the effects of such actions and their corrupting repercussions, right? So it warns us against all of these things because we don't want to have anything to do with that punishment, some of which we have described today. And then where has it come from? Rabbikum, the ayah says, from your Lord, subhanAllah, from your Lord. Yani, um, if you look at, um, there's a chapter on Adab Talawat al Quran, um, manners or etiquettes of recitation of the Quran. And he talks about external and internal acts of recitation. And the first couple that he mentions that I wanted to share today number one, he says, we must have a reverence for the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know the power, to know the grandeur and majesty of his speech. And then his great mercy in revealing that majestic speech from his throne into this world for people to understand. If you think about it, Allah, who is all independent, didn't ever need to speak to any of his creation. And us helpless, powerless, weak creatures of clay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all independent of him having to speak to us. But he did so as one of the greatest manifestations of divine mercy to save us, to guide us. He took his eternal attribute of speech and revealed it in human words for us to comprehend. This is uh, from Imam Ghazali's work. The power of his words would destroy everything had he not concealed that, as in the case of Musa Islam and the mountain. So then Imam Ghazali mentions how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy, you know, revealed his speech in human words so that we could uh, you know, understand them and take them in and recite them. Um, because Allah in his essence and his speech is part of his essence, his kalam is part of his essence. That is something that cannot be born by the human being. As you know from the example of when Musa السلام, asked Allah to allow him to see him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Lan tarani, you can never see me, but look at the mountain if it is able to stay in its place, you shall see me. And then we know what happened, right? Musa alayhi salam, um, when, when uh, Allah revealed himself to the mountain, it crumbled and Musa alayhi salam became unconscious, right? So that shows that how we cannot bear, uh, you know, the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. And his speech is part of his essence, but in his mercy, he made it in a form that we can actually take in and absorb, right? So this is what he means when he says Allah revealed his eternal speech into the level of human words and actions. So the words of the physical body to the inner soul of wisdom and meaning. In short, the word of God is like an unseen emperor in the deepest cover whose face is not visible, yet whose authority is all prevalent. It is a scorching sun whose rays are blazing while its body is concealed. It is a radiant star guiding the lost ones on their journey. It is the key to invaluable treasure, a life elixir whose sip will ward off death forever, a remedy for disease which leaves no ailment when taken. SubhanAllah. So, reverence for Allah's speech. It is an exhortation, but you know, not just any exhortation, but it is an exhortation from the Lord of the worlds. So to have reverence for his speech, and that is a spirit that we can try to adopt as we recite the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, we'll not be able to complete uh, verse 57, which is uh, just wonderful because it requires um, more than we can give it uh, anyway. So... We're going to conclude here and restart with uh, the explanation of verse 57. Next Monday, no class, uh, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. We will uh, restart, inshallah, on Monday. Um, so may all of you continue to have a blessed Ramadan where we really try to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all the moments of our 
wakefulness inshallah subhanaka wa bihamdika la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh